name is Tola Collier. Uh, I'm a military historian and this is my colleague Steve Gary. And we're here to talk to you today about the Williamite War 1689 to 1691 and an aspect of that war which is described as the revolution in military affairs. Now, the Williamite War was part of a wider European war uh, which was fought between an alliance of states who were fighting against Louis XIV of France. Now France was the most populous country in Europe, a little bit like America today. It was looking to achieve a, what's known as a hegemony control of Europe. And other states in Europe were opposed to that. Now Louis had decided that he wanted to cause as much disruption as possible for the alliance. And for one part of that alliance in particular, which was King William of Orange. William was the head of the Dutch Republic, of the House of Orange, but he had also recently been given the crown of England. And he had got that crown from James II. James II fled to France, organized mainly by his wife, and his wife organised a political alliance with Louis and Louis said to James you're still technically the King of Ireland I'm going to give you soldiers and weapons and equipment go to Ireland and claim your throne back in Ireland the Irish um, had been organised by Tyrconnell um, he took the country for the King and was willing to fight in a war to keep Ireland as, as James's kingdom. Now that's all the tedious stuff. The next thing that happens is James raises an army in Ireland, they are Jacobites. William comes over to Ireland to join an army which was supporting a rebellion in Ulster and they are the Williamites. And that's as complex as it gets in terms of the two armies on the island at the time. The next part is those armies are being supported by William's own treasury for the Williamites and for the four Jacobites, the French are providing most of the money and most of the weaponry. Okay? Now, as with all things to do with war, war is constantly evolving. And in 1689 to 1691, you have armies changing out of all recognition. Previously, armies had been smaller, they had been uh, professional in terms of the soldiers, the men who were fighting them, they normally did it and that was their life's work. Now at the end of the 17th century you begin to get into mass standing armies. That's armies who are assembled as regiments, they are not just formed for a particular purpose for one war and countries and alliances can send out larger and larger armies to fight on the battlefield. So in Ireland, in 1690, you have the largest battle in Ireland, and that's fought at the Battle of the Boyne. And on that day, June the 1st, in 1690, you have 60,000 soldiers on a battlefield in Ireland. After that, the battles get slightly smaller. You're looking at about 20, 25,000 on each side, and you have a series of sieges. Common to all of these formations are the infantry soldiers, and that's what we're down to here. Now, I am a musketeer from 1690, 1689 to 1690. Some of the changes that have come in is in the uniform that the soldiers wear. Okay, regiments of soldiers were raised by their local colonels, tended to be the people that they worked for. Okay. So the colonel would dictate the uniform that the soldiers wore. Now, the red coat that I'm wearing, these days people have an idea of it as being an elite type of symbol. The red coats are coming, that type of thing. In 1690, and when the coats were first used, red was simply the cheapest colour that the quartermasters and the colonels could dye a uniform and that was affordable. The colonels who raised the regiments paid for the regiments and then were reimbursed by the army that they fought with. So they were looking to fight war on the cheap. Other types of uniforms that would have been worn generally would have been grey or blue, as you can see there. 
Now the recognition features, all of the regiments would have had different colours or facings that they used. So you would have had yellow facings, red facings, and particular to Ireland, you had a colour called Philomot. Philomot was a sort of a burnt pinky brown colour that was developed in Ireland because they liked the colour which was used on some of the French uniforms. So that's why each uniform, each regiment identified itself by a different coloured coat and different facings. Sorry, the colour did you mention it is? Well, that's just grey, with, with red, with scarlet, as it would have been called. The, the uniform that I talked about, which would have been worn by a regiment, say Clare's regiment, is called Philobot. Can you spell it? I cannot. I can do many things, madam, but I cannot smell Philomot. Uh, it's basically a bastardization of the French word for dried leaves. So it's a, it's a kind of a russet colour. If you look it up on the internet, you'll see it. Uh, and it's, it's quite a pleasant colour. So that would have been used for the facings on particular uniform. And in the one we're talking about, that would have been Clare's regiment who would have worn it. Now once the soldiers are formed into their regiments, they're trained. And this is where another major change comes in what we're describing as the revolution in affairs. Previously there had been um, musketeers and pikemen. Now, in the 16th century, it's the 17th century, more muskets are being used. And the reason more muskets are being used is because Muskets are easier to train soldiers to fight with. If you're going to create a pikeman or a cavalryman, they need a certain amount of skill or strength or stamina to start with. If you're going to train a musketeer, you can train a musketeer in between two and five days. And in general terms, it depends on how stupid the person that you're trying to train is. Because you've got to train them to make about 47 to 49 different movements with the musket to load and aim and fire the musket. Okay? Now this particular musket that I have is about the most basic musket. It would have been the musket that was equipped to most of the Jacobite soldiers at the beginning of the war and a lot also of the Williamite. And it's a matchlock musket. Okay? It has a barrel on a wooden um, body and it uses a slow burning match cord attached to what's known as a serpentine and that's controlled by the trigger. Okay? It then uses a slow burning match. In battle the musketeer would have carried about a yard of match ready to go and burning at both ends. So the musketeer would have been equipped with a pound of match, a pound of powder and a pound of shot. And that would have been what he would have used to, to fight as a soldier. To load the musket, he would have been equipped with pre-loaded pouches in an apostle. And that's what this thing here is. Now it's called an apostle because it has 12 pre-loaded wooden pouches. Each of the tubes would have contained a measured charge of powder. And when the soldier came to load his musket, he would have opened the apostle and poured the powder down into the barrel. He then would have taken a ball, placed it into the barrel, dropped it, and then he would have rammed it home. Then he would have put wadding on top of that, rammed it home, and then he would have made sure that his pan was primed. This is the pan, and he would have used a finer grain of powder to prime the pan. So he empties a charge into the pan, then he makes sure that his pan is closed. Because if he doesn't, as he tips it up, all of the priming powder will come out and your gun won't function. So you make sure that you close it. Then you stand ready, facing your enemy, who is between 80 and 100 yards away. And you're arranged on the battlefield in blocks of 100 to 300 to 500 men. Your officers are trying to manoeuvre you as close to each other as possible. 
because the weapon you're using, even though it can shoot maybe up to 200 yards, it only has an accurate range of 75 to 100 yards. And that's firing, I'll, I'll answer questions later, that's firing against a line of troops that are opposing you. So when you're told to give fire, you would bring it up, you would test your match, you see when I pull the trigger that the match comes forward, and you test that it falls on the top of your pan, and when you're told to fire, you would normally hold it, not up to your eye to aim it, but against your chest, and then, pulling the trigger, you would drop your match into your pan, woof, bang, and your musket ball goes down range. And then you would repeat the process, loading it, priming it, and going through. A very well-trained, good musketeer would fire two to three rounds a minute. So quite slow. But the big advantage that they see at the time is you can create large blocks of musketeers, large blocks of infantry soldiers that can do a great deal of damage when you assemble them correctly in formation on the battlefield. Now the great enemies of the musketeer and the infantry soldier are the cavalrymen. And that's the main difficulty. Up to this point, the infantry, the musketeers, are protected by pikemen. But as I said, pikemen take time to train, they need a degree of skill, and when they are not engaging cavalry, they're basically not functioning. If they're not doing their job, they're not doing anything else. So the generals and the officers want to create as much firepower as possible by having more and more musketeers. So they're looking to find a way in which the musketeer can protect himself from cavalry. Now how that comes about, and I have to turn my back on you to do it, is in the town of Bayonne in France with the invention of the bayonet. Now the bayonet was originally used by hunters in the Spanish and French Pyrenees to finish off wild boar. And what they would do is they would have their hunting knives, they would insert it into the muzzle of their musket and when they shot the prey, usually wild boar, they could go and they could finish it off cleanly with the knife. The French king sees the bayonet issued to a group of soldiers in his employ. It's a very good idea and it begins another revolution which is to equip the musketeer with a means of defending himself from cavalry. Because when you fix this to your musket, you can now prepare to receive cavalry. And I'll just move slightly forward so we can show you how that is done. So you would have a group of men, as I say, up to 500, 800 strong, fixed bayonets, and prepared to receive cavalry. And it pushed forward into the cavalry. So what you're looking to do is you're looking to stab the horse, not the rider. Because you take the horse out or you injure the horse, the rider falls to the ground, and you can then finish them off at your leisure. The problem with this is, if you fire two to three rounds from it, the barrel, particularly on a day like today, has expanded and then contracted and it's jammed in your muzzle. So the sergeant, he calls out, sergeant, sergeant, he's supposed to come along with a mallet, tap it and clear it out of the top of the barrel. If that's not possible, you reverse it, put your shoe, the sole of your shoe on it, push it and hopefully get it off the muzzle to get it back into action as a gun again. Because if your gun isn't firing and you don't have your supporting pikemen, you're in a world of hurt. Now this weapon which I have here is the next step forward. It's the next evolution. And it is the fusil, the flint lock musket. Fusil is the French version. This is a weapon that would have been issued by the French to their soldiers fighting in Ireland uh, and also issued to their allies in Ireland. The Dutch and the English soldiers would have had similar versions made in England. Dutch muskets were considered among the best, then the French and the English were considered to be, at this time, not so good. They'd been in their armories for a long time, they were also often rusty and they didn't work very well. Now I'm just going to go back in, if you'll forgive me, 
get under some cover because it is extremely hot today and I am wearing wool and linen so at the moment it's it's a, you wouldn't believe the heat that I'm beginning to feel so you can imagine the soldier on the battlefield who is faced with that now the great advantage of the fusel is it is quicker to load um, and quicker to fire now the same thing applies you would take your cartridge from your bag tear the top off your cartridge pour your powder down the muzzle of your gun scrunch up your cartridge take your musket ball place it in take your rod they were called scouring rods or ramrods ram that home to make sure it's nice and compressed and then remembering to take your ramrod back out reverse it place it back into your weapon because if you leave it in your weapon you'll fire it at the enemy and it might even kill some of the enemy but your sergeant will then come along and tell you to go and get your ramrod back which is something you don't want to have to do so you make sure that you keep it then the same thing again you bring your piece up you can do it in one of two ways you can carry and they did a powder horn load your charge powder into it or you can have held some of the charge back or use it before you load empty it into the frizzle then bring your hammer to half cock close your frizzle which is now spring loaded powder won't fall out and now making sure you bring it to full cock you can bring it up and you can aim it with a little more accuracy and fire the sparks from the flint strike that go into the pan ignite the powder and fire at the enemy so it's a quicker and more efficient way of doing it it's slightly heavier and it's more uh, more effective but you are beginning to create more efficient soldiers now at the battle of the Boyne and in certain areas around Ireland um, a new type of soldier was coming to the fore and that type of soldier was the fusilier. Fusiliers were the first soldiers to be equipped with the bayonet and also to be equipped with muskets on slings and the reason was that they could sling it on their shoulder and that left their hands free for them to help in place artillery because a fusilier's job was to protect and move with the cannons and help to emplace them on the battlefield. And they were equipped with the plug bayonet to protect the guns from cavalry. The other type of soldier, also using a musket with a sling and a bayonet, was the grenadier. And in front of you there, you have an example of a grenadier in Ireland. Now grenadiers soon became an elite force because they had to be taller, slightly fitter and had to be able to throw a grenade. And this is a grenade. Now the word grenade comes from pomegranate but it's basically a bomb with some slow match, the same type of slow match as used on the matchlock musket. It's lit, it'll burn down for between three and five seconds has a black powder charge inside and then it's thrown into defences like the castle here or it's thrown into enemy formations to break them up. The grenadiers have to be brave because they're marched in companies, one company attached to each regiment and they're used as shock troops to break into defended positions and to break up enemy formations. It's shocking for them as well because in that job you're always up the sharp end and you're also a soldier who is expected to be able to spot an opportunity that means you might also be slightly more intelligent than the officer who is directing you so you're fully aware of the job that you're doing and the threat that's posed to you you know that you're going to be shot at your grenade could be picked up and frequently was thrown back at you now in Ireland the grenadiers uh, were supplied by France we know that only Jacobite grenadiers and the Jacobite army were issued with bayonets. 
In the Williamite army, there were Dutch and English and Irish uh, grenadiers, and they would have been equipped with the bayonet. But not all of the regiments, if you remember I said earlier, who were raised by different officers, would be universally equipped with the same weapon. And that leads to some interesting situations, such as at the Battle of the Boy in 1690, when the Dutch Blue Guard, dressed somewhat like this, in grey or blue tunics, march into the river, come up on the far side, and as you hear about when you're talking about uh, the Ukraine, crossing a river is one of the most difficult operations that an army can carry out. They come up on the far side of the River Boyne, clear out Old Bridge Village, and then they establish a lodgement. On the other side of the river, they're engaged by Jacobite infantry. They drive them off, and then they see coming onto the battlefield possibly the finest light cavalry in Europe. They were the Jacobite light horse. The Jacobite light horse would have been equipped with shortened carbines, pistols, usually two, and also with a sword. And this is a cavalry sword. Now it's a long sword because you're on a horse and you have to be able to reach down to get at the person that you're trying to kill. However, most of the time it's not used for stabbing or slashing, it's couched to the side with your reins in your hand, you use the weight and the speed of the horse with the sword held out to the side to clip your opponent in the head. So you're basically inflicting head wounds and blunt force trauma. Now in the wars in Ireland, and in particular at a battle near here, at Ockram, armies stand and they face each other for several hours trading blows. And the number of casualties that the army produces uh, is relatively small. You can get maybe out of a five hour long engagement, one or two thousand casualties. The real damage is done by the first army which breaks. The army which is either broken up by artillery or the army whose officers are shot, as happened at Ockram, where St. Ruth is shot. They lose cohesion and they break up as formations because then the cavalry ride in among them and in the course of an hour, an hour and a half, you have three to 4,000 casualties being inflicted on the soldiers who are being cut down as they flee the battlefield. So if you lose cohesion, all is lost. And that's the type of thing that loses wars. Now, moving on as to what can happen to an army. The matchlock musket and the fusil are the beginning of what is known as the universal soldier. You know, as I've said, you have the pikeman protecting the musketeer, the musketeer getting a bayonet so that he can protect himself from the cavalry. The problem with the blood bayonet is it gets jammed in the muzzle. So what some smart man in France called Vauban, who also develops fortifications, comes up with is the socket bayonet. This fits to the musket like that and it's offset to the side. Can you see? Pant to one side. That means that when you have your bayonet fixed, you can engage the enemy, so you can get three to five rounds off, depending on how proficient you are. When you get in among the enemy, if you charge, you have a weapon which can, you can use on the enemy infantry, and if the enemy cavalry come for you, you can prepare to receive cavalry. So you have one soldier, one type of soldier, capable of gaining and holding ground. That begins to get into the universal soldier concept. Right, at that stage, I think I'll take a short break for something to drink, and if you'd like to ask me any questions while I'm having a quick drink, if that's okay. Yes, go ahead. Can you actually shoot off that gun? Is it a real gun? Yes, it is. Um, all of the arms that you see are all legally held, uh, but they all are lot muskets. Any other questions of, of what I've been saying so far? Anybody got any particular interests or things that they'd like to hear more about? No? Okay, great. That, well, that's always nice to hear. Now, moving on. What happens when you get shot? Right. Um, 
prior to the evolution of firearms, you have a group of people who are barber surgeons. Barber surgeons were given uh, permission by the church in Rome to carry out surgical procedures and to cut hair and to draw the blood of another Christian. A Christian could only draw the blood of another Christian if they were given a papal dispensation. That is where the barber surgeons come from. This good man here is a barber surgeon. This is my good friend Steve Gary. Now before Steve starts to talk, I would just like to finish my presentation with one thing. And that one thing is this. This is the musket ball remover. Um, more and more wounds begin to be generated on the battlefield by guns. More and more people survive as casualties with a musket ball embedded in their body. Right? Uh, it causes blunt force trauma. In other words, it tears up tissue and muscle, shatters bone. You can, you can remove it in two ways, but you can't repair it. Either amputation, which Steve will talk to you about, or using the musket ball remover. And the musket ball remover was based on an earlier device which was called the arrowhead remover, and that was used on the head of an English king. But this, anyway, the victim, the casualty is brought in, placed on a table or in a position where they could be assessed. The wound is found. Imagine this as being the wound. The musket ball remover is then placed into the wound and it's then used to navigate the wound channel. When a musket ball hits you, it'll go in and it'll cavitate through the body. So you could have to go quite some way before you find it. When you find the hard object and you click on it, and you might be able to hear that little click there, you then begin to turn the key at the back and the lead ball inside the body being slightly warmer and slightly more malleable should be capable of being drilled into and as you see the drill bit begins to come out of the top of the musket ball remover so that's drilled down into the musket ball and then when he gets three full rotations knowing he's got a good purchase in the musket ball the barber surgeon can then pull that back out and hopefully remove the ball from the body now I'll leave you with this idea and Steve will tell you more about it. Oftentimes the musket ball is successfully removed from the body, but more people die of post-operative infection afterwards than actually die of the gunshot wound. So with that said, and I will talk about other things as the day goes on, thank you very much for listening to my presentation. I hope I haven't been too boring. And I'll now hand you over to my very good colleague, Steve Gary, to talk about the barber surgeon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. So, as Tom mentioned, the barber surgeon started because the barber was the only person that the church allowed to draw blood from another person without falling foul of the church rules. So his first tool was a thing that looked like this. Now, it's not dissimilar to the sort of thing that's used for sheep shearing sheep these days, but that's your hair cutting tool. So if you think your hair cutting treatment is a little bit strange now, think back to what this might have been like 350 years ago. That was the hair cutting system. And that evolved into the barber becoming also a surgeon who was able to perform various treatments on people after they'd been either injured or become ill. Bear in mind the Williamite armies were about 30,000 strong. So that's 30,000 people that are moving around the countryside as part of the fighting force. And to put that in context, that is bigger than the population of the town of Athlone. Athlone's a population of about 22,000. So if you imagine the whole town of Athlone moving around the countryside on a day-to-day -day basis to fight somebody else, that's the sort of size group you're talking about. It's a lot of people. So you'd have had other injuries. You'd have had people that have been kicked by horses, perhaps got a broken leg or something like that, or they had teeth that weren't particularly pleasant, you know, that they needed sorting out. And of course, bear in mind, techniques were different. Anesthetic, that's easy. Let's say that something's hurting you. Oh, that hurts. Bite on that. It still hurts. Bite a bit harder. 
because they didn't have the anaesthetics that are available to us now for knocking people out. The only anaesthetic they'd have had at those times would have been alcohol. And you need an awful lot of that to knock somebody out if they're in pain. So that's, that's how this all started. And then as Tola said, we then go on to musket balls. You get one of them hit you, you know about it. There's an ounce of lead there. And that ounce of lead is travelling at a good speed. If it hits you, it doesn't just bounce off. It's, it goes in and it does damage. Hopefully you might get it out. If you didn't, and the wound started to faster, because again, in the same way that we didn't have anti, anti you know, we didn't have anaesthetics, we didn't have much in the, there was well, there was no antibiotics or other treatments that they could give people to actually help heal wounds. And in some cases, you ended up with a situation where the person concerned, you had, a, you were faced with a very simple choice: you either remove the limb person dies. So, how do you do that? Well, the first thing is, you give them the anaesthetic. Then you get two or three of your helpers to hold them in position, because likely as not, they're not going to enjoy what's about to happen. And you grab one of these. Now, these would have been, in those days, very, very sharp. These, fortunately, I'm not quite so sharp, so I can I can demonstrate the principle without actually putting myself at risk. Depending on whether you were dealing with an arm or a leg. But literally, the helpers would hold the limb out, they would take the knife, they would literally go right the way around the flesh, down to the bone with the knife, and then grab a tool like that to finish the job off with the bones. And then sew you up. Now, Remember it's about no anaesthetic? That's where this little device came into play. When you started with the patient, you turned your timer over. If by the time you finished, you still sat at the top, sand in the top of your timer, there was a good chance the patient would survive because they hadn't lost that much blood. If the sand ran out in that, before you finished stitching the patient up and tying off the various veins and arteries that needed tying off, using a kit that was probably similar to this, the needles I won't take out because they're not, they're fairly sharp, you can see their stitching cord is a lot more coarse than the stitching cord that would be used for stitches today. And the wax is there to, it, to put wax on the string first of all to make sure that it would actually slide through and could be tied off and stay tight. If the sand had run out, then there's likelihood that the patient had lost too much blood. If the sand hadn't run out, then hopefully the patient will survive. They might not be quite as capable as they were of doing whatever it was they used to do. They certainly wouldn't be firing muskets or fighting battles, but they wouldn't be, they wouldn't be dead at the end of the day. Not dead is a pretty attractive option. So, what else did the barber surgeon do? Well, again, coming back to our famous friend here, the anaesthetic. If it was a musket ball he was removing, depending on where the musket ball had gone in and how much damage it did on the way in, they might stitch the wound closed. If it was a relatively clean wound, you handed out your anaesthetic again, you heated this little device over a flame, and having heated it over the flame, you then cauterized the wound. And if any of you have ever managed to burn yourselves on an oven or anything else like that, you know how exquisitely painful that is. So imagine something like that that's nearly red hot being used to actually deliberately burn the flesh to close the wound off. It was very brutal medicine in comparison to the sorts of things that happen today, but it was all that they could do at the time because that was how it was. Now, remember we were talking about the anaesthetic? The barber surgeon was also the dentist and he would use a tool, something like that one. Not dissimilar to the tools that are used today in some respects. To 
pull teeth out. Only one problem. You can't give the patient the usual anaesthetic because you want to work in their mouth. So you have to find another way of dealing with the problem. And that's where this wonderful looking tool comes into play. Because I don't know about anybody else, but as far as I'm concerned, I'm not about to start putting my fingers in somebody's mouth if there's a danger they won't come back out again. So you have a tool like this. And that gets put between the jaws and then wound in the appropriate direction. And as you wind it, the jaws separate. And eventually it reaches the stage where no matter how hard the patient tries, if that's in your mouth between your jaws, you're not about to take my fingers off. So there's a chance that I can now go in with my appropriate tool and remove whichever tooth it is that's causing you problems. So because again, bear in mind, uh, the anaesthetic at the time is somewhat limited. So hopefully you had lots and lots and lots of whiskey or gin before you started. Otherwise you're going to know about it. So that's, oh yes, that's a thing called a trocar. And it was used, I'm sure you've all seen it on things like Grey's Anatomy on the television and things like that. Somebody's having trouble breathing and they've got to either do, um, they've either got to let air into their airway in their throat or they've got to release air that's trapped in the lung. Be thankful I'm a surgeon and not a vet. Because somebody comes along with this tool, they put it against the skin, somewhere about here, and this thing gets banged in and because there's a sharp point there, it starts there, it goes wallop, pull that out, the air can escape. Now as a surgeon, I'm letting air out. Be thankful I'm not a vet, because if I was a vet, you could be into serious problems. Because if you were doing this, say, in a barn, and there's not much light around you, somebody else is standing there holding a candle to let you see what's going on. And unfortunately, cattle, if they've got certain types of diseases, produce large quantities of methane. That goes against the skin, bang, in it goes, pull that out, whoosh, out comes methane. Here's candle. Candle and methane tend to produce a flame about that long, which is not exactly what you want happening if you're standing in a barn trying to clip help uh, solve the problems that a cow's having. In that, likely as not, you're going to leave the area extremely rapidly because if you've got hay and straw around you, which is as dry as we're seeing at the moment, methane and dry straw or hay do not mix. So that's the sort of some of the sorts of things that the vet, the barber surgeon became involved with. I won't frighten you with too much with what that was used for. It looks like a drill. A tool like it is still used today in certain circumstances for different reasons in the hospitals today. If you get somebody who's had a serious road traffic accident or similar and they've got pressure on the brain and they need to relieve that pressure on the brain, they'll use a tool not dissimilar to this to drill a hole in the skull so that they can take a small disc of skull out and relieve the pressure. And a tool like that would have been used 300 years ago. Sometimes for different reasons. Sometimes it was to help re resolve the problem of a head injury caused by the sword hitting somebody's head and causing them severe trauma. Or unfortunately, sometimes it was because in those times, certain people believed that if you had something like epilepsy, you had a devil in your head. So that was how you let the devil out. Unfortunately, things have moved on a little from that. They have indeed. And, unfortunately, on that note, we've pretty much come full circle. And if I can just maybe try and tie it all together for you. When we started talking, uh, we were talking about the revolution in military affairs in the 17th century. Um, I hope that you've seen in the course of this demonstration that Ireland in the 17th century, during the Williamite Wars, is a country which is more involved in the affairs of Europe than we often care to think even today. And that also by the armies who were engaged in that war, bringing new and varied types of technology to Ireland for military purposes, other purposes and other advantages came about, whereby medicine improved, due to increased battlefield casualties, uh, improvements in metallurgy, 
improvements in logistics and supply and how massed armies were fed on the battlefield. So with that note, I'll just ask, has anybody got any more questions? Yes, indeed. Yeah, and then we'll, we'll call it a day. So we'll have to, two questions and then we'll, we'll call it a day. Just tying those two things together in terms of, um, you know, you talk, for example, about Boyne or Auckland yeah. and, and the mass of people there and the, um, the presence of the surgeons and um, were, were they on the battlefield and did they have things like hospital tents and was there something like the Red Cross or the Red Crescent where there was a sacrosanctus about being able to treat injured soldiers without being mown down on the battlefield? Okay. So that didn't have to hope happen to post battle. Superb questions. First of all, there were no Red Cross and no Red Crescent. They, they come in much later on. Um, there was also no great sacrosanctity for casualties on the battlefield. If you became a casualty, you were generally relieved of your uniform, your worldly goods. Uh, if you were wealthy enough to be saved, you'd be taken off the battlefield to a barber surgeon who would save you if you could afford to pay him or if you could be identified as being worth saving. Now, soldiers did receive medical pay from barber surgeons in the employment of the state. That was mainly to look after minor wounds. Uh, but the gentry, the higher echelons were treated first and then everybody else after that. Uh, there were, in, 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 in terms of a battle at the time, you would have had, say, at the Boyne, you had 60,000 soldiers. It's a manoeuvre battle over a wide area. But supporting those 60,000 soldiers, you've 120,000 people who are involved in what we now call logistics. So that would have been the barber surgeons, sutlers who would have fed them. Uh, you would have had people who baked bread, people who basically recycled uniforms and captured equipment on the battlefield. Uh, you would have had camp followers, people who provided entertainment and that type of thing. Armies would have advanced on campaign with everything that the society that that army came from expected to have with them. Some of it they would have got in the form of rations and the rest of it they would have paid for in cold hard cash. So I hope that answers your question. Excellent. You sir. How likely would it have been for someone when you got hit with a bullet to actually die? Um, well, a little bit better than 50-50. Uh, as I said earlier, the accuracy uh, on like this, this is the, we'll call this an English musket ball, this is a French musket ball. You're firing it from a matchlock or a, or a flintlock musket. You could face at 100 yards a line of infantry and not get hit at all. So that's your best chance of survival, not getting hit. Once you get hit, um, you, as I said, a lot of people survived the initial wound. Um, but they would have died from post-operative infection afterwards. Also, on the battlefield, you're facing something an awful lot bigger than a musket ball. You're also facing artillery. So the artillery, this would have been a standard three-pound cannonball uh, fired from an artillery piece over open sights. So literally, these would have been aimed at the formations of men and horse on the battlefield. And what the gunners would be trying to do would be fire that from the gun so it hits the ground in front of the line of troops and it skips through the lines of troops. So the first guy who gets hit, he's going to lose a leg. Second guy, he's not going to have children anymore, might not be able to go to the bathroom. And the very unlucky ones are going to get decapitated, as happened at Ockram by St. Ruth, because the cannon is on too high a trajectory, or he goes into the arc of fire and that hits him in the head. Um, on the other hand, at the beginning of the war, William of Orange is at the Battle of the Boyne. He's riding around inspecting his troops, building up morale. He's seen by Jacobite gunners. A ball about this side is fired at him. It scrapes, it grazes his shoulder, and it, it burns through his doublet. His surgeon is called. They dress it, treat it. They say that they want to have him leached. Uh, in other words, they say that they want to draw blood. He's probably more likely to have died from that than he was from a wound that he was able to get up from. William gets up, recovers from the wound, and he goes out to be seen by the rest of his army moving around because he doesn't want it to travel and demoralize his army that the king is dead. 
right? But news travels way faster than you would imagine, and the Pope in Rome hears that William has been killed at the Battle of the Boy and orders the bells to be rung. So I think that in itself gets around another part of the mythology of the Williamite Wars and the Battle of the Boy. William was allied with the Pope. It was a war about material, political control, and coincidentally, a war about religious ascendancy in Ireland. So, excellent questions, and thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure. You've been a wonderful audience. Thank you.